it just grew and grew and grew, and I think that's that's helped um, helped communicate a message to everyone about what Darrenberg is, because and that's why really it is the whole um, big Darrenberg cube puzzle, is because our label names are such a puzzle to work out. Wine is a massive puzzle to work out. Most people, you know, in their lifetime never work it out fully, you know, yeah. and uh, only only the few really get get it very well. And they, you know, obviously the winemakers are the ones who get it the most because that's what we're doing is living and breathing it and turning every little bit of soil into a grape, then into all the wine and, and understanding how that relationship works with different weather patterns of every year. So, so it, yeah, it's a massive puzzle. So it was a perfect environment to portray what wine is about and Darenberg's about. Chester, thank you so much for allowing me to join you here at the Cube for our next episode of Be The Drop. Hi Amelia, how are you doing? I'm, I am very excited to be Great. sitting here <laughs> in the beautiful Macaron Vale in this incredible building. Well, we're almost in it. We're actually at the missing cube. So you see the fallen cube, you see the one down in the car park there? Yeah. Well, that's actually the fallen cube and this is where it's missing from. So Great. <laughs> to get us started, to introduce us to yourself and Get, show us a little bit behind the scenes. I've asked you to bring an item of significance and I know you've got two. So yep. perhaps you can explain those to us. Sure, so a loud shirt, which is a little bit revealing and not only because of the red wine stains, but, but <laughs> just because of the women on it. Um, loud shirts, what everyone knows me, really everywhere I go I wear a loud shirt and, uh, and they go, why do you wear a loud shirt? And I say, because it brings everything alive. Great. But life should be, life should be full of colour and fun and excitement. Yeah, and you've also got a second item there. That's right. I've got the uh, the Darrenberg cube here to solve for you. You can have this one. Oh, fabulous! Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not easy. Yeah. So each each of those lines go from the bottom in dead straight line back to the bottom again. So when you lay it out flat, they're all dead straight. Except, and one line goes from the bottom and then goes around and stops at the top. And that's how I designed the, the building. So yeah. fantastic. Let's start with colour and why that's so important to share that. You know, you really talked about interacting with other people, feeding off each other. You know, how does that work for you and, and why is it important? Well, I think it's important because I got indoctrinated with it when I was young. My mother always put me in really loud clothes. She even put me in ties to go to McLaren Vale Primary School. I think I was the first child to ever wear a tie at McLaren Vale Primary. And that sort of rubbed off on me, I suppose. And, and then also for a while there, I am um, in my very early 20s, when I finished studying at Roseworthy College, I went home and, and I moved into a house and I didn't have a television. I didn't listen to any commercial radio. I listened to the, uh, what was it called? The uh, metaphysical show. And they, they talked about colour and how each of these colours actually mean something to you. Like green is, is health and, and blue is peace and red is vibrant and loud and colourful, you know, uh, conversation and you know, invigorating and so on. And so, so I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So I think I still use those, you know, every now and then when I, when I think I've got to win a, an argument in a, in a board meeting or something, I wear a more red shirt, you know, because red's the winning colour apparently. And blue, <laughs> blue's the more losing colour, you know, so. so you've really embraced that and brought it inside. Yeah, yeah. Now, it, the building is um, white, of course, the pattern on the outside and that, and that moves into the building as well. The floors are all white as well, polished white concrete. The ceiling is exposed white concrete with white big panels. And there's in the few black lines for the, each of the outside edges of the, of the cube. So really it's only white and black. And so I, I really felt it needed some real excitement, explosions in there to make it come alive. This is 14 odd years ago, nearly 15 years ago now, I built this model about you know, this uh, you know, half a metre high. Um, and I went, well, I can't just have a square building because it's just going to look like an office block, uh, even with you know, it being the, the black curved edges and whatever. Uh, I, I turned the top one and turned the next one down and I, yeah, let's pull out a few blocks. You know, that'll make a bigger floor as well. And, um, and yeah, we, we've got to do something. There was a really bad building down in the car park for the uh, bore and so I needed to change that. So well, we'll just have one fallen out and that'll give us an outdoor area as well. And then <laughs> and that, that becomes like some crazy weird thing down there and uh, and now it's come to fruition so what, what how does that feel now that you've got people coming and connecting and is it is it getting 
the connection and the response that you had hoped has you know what's that been like um yeah i think it's it is in fact it's uh, better in some ways it's busier and i think i'm getting more people zealous about the whole project when i walk through here it's impossible to go anywhere without people taking a picture and wanting to talk to me about what they you know what they think about it and it's all been really positive so it just grew and grew and grew and i think that's that's helped um help communicate a message to everyone about what darenberg is because mm. and that's why really it is the whole um big darenberg cube puzzle is because our label names are such a puzzle to work out wine is a massive puzzle to work out most people you know in their lifetime never work it out fully you know yeah. and, and uh, only, only the few really get get it very well, and they, you know, obviously the winemakers are the ones who get it the most because that's what we're doing is living and breathing it and turning every little bit of soil into a grape, then into all the wine, and, and understanding how that relationship works with different weather patterns mm -hmm. of every year. So, so it, yeah, it's a massive puzzle. So, it was a perfect environment to portray what wine is about and Darenberg's about. Fantastic. So, you know, you sort of alluded to that in. In your answer there, the Darenberg story. Can you perhaps just walk me through about, you know, the, the journey, the family journey? Yeah, so my great grandfather was a director of Hardy's Wines from about 1881 to 1912. When he sold all of his horses, he was the biggest race stakes earner of horses from 1900 to 1912. And he sold all his horses to buy this property for 24,000 pounds in 1912. We've been in the wine industry effectively for 137 years, you know, from 1881. Uh, and um, then my grandfather, he built the winery in 1927. And um, uh, we still do everything the same way as what he designed it with all submerged cap ferments, um, basket press, you know, we foot tread all the fermenters. And you see that through all of the art down there in the gallery. It's all very much emphasising the four generations and what they communicated with and also what, how, they make, how we're making our wines. Yep. So my father, he joined the company when he was about 14, 15 years old. Well, they worked you know, all the time anyway, because they did for war years and whatever. Um, uh, so he joined the company in the 40s, 43, I think, roughly. And he worked the whole vineyard by hand, you know, a horse. There was no tractors, there was no power. Wow. It was all stationary engines and whatever. And uh, um, so he's seen a lot of changes. He's still around now. He still comes to work every day, 91 years old. Fantastic. Um, and then I joined the company in 1983 after finishing a, a degree in winemaking. But I'd always worked from the age of seven. Half of all my holidays, I'd worked through the winery. And I took a year off before university to do work in the winery and another winery as well. So I'd sort of grown up with it anyway, like mm -hmm. he did for years people would come up and, and want to buy the company and dad would say well what do I do with the money and they'd say well you should invest it with what you know and he said well I know about vineyards and wineries I've already got one of them so why, why, why do another one you know sort of thing and, and so uh, he didn't really care for money he didn't really want more money he's just like the lifestyle and, yeah. and he was getting ready for me anyway to come home and we don't get many offers anymore because I think the the uh, the company is well established internationally now and sort of like I suppose their upside I suppose of someone coming in and buying the company they're thinking well maybe there's not a lot of upside so mm. no or maybe they just know that we're not we'd never sell anyway which we wouldn't you know someone asked me the other day you know if you off, got offered a billion dollars would you sell I said no why would I want to sell you know what what am I going to do then I start all over again that's going to be a nightmare yeah. I'm too old to do that and uh, it just um, and it's just money anyway and uh, you know you, I've got a great lifestyle and yeah. you know, we're doing well enough so why why bother yeah and so for your dad 91 years of age and you know processing the the wine horse and cart style to what it is now and to then you know having this the cube as your wine how, how how's that transition for him um well i've been very fortunate that my father believed in me and to let me do a lot of what i wanted to do so I was the first trained winemaker, I suppose, at Darabig, after four, you know, being the fourth generation. So he thought, well, you're trained now, so you make wine. So when I came back in 83, he said, just you do it, you know. And, uh, and so that was pretty lucky. I mean, I show, involved him for quite a few years, for quite a while, in what I was doing and showing him the wines. But he, he was just positive all the time about what I was doing. But in the end, I just, you know, just kept doing it, you know. I said to my um, father when I was in the 80s, I said, oh God, we've got the vine pool scheme in 1985. I missed all that huge boom of the 60s and 70s of the big red wine boom of when people all started to drink wine. It would have been great to have been born, you know, and to see all that, it would have been fun to be accelerating and make, you know, get, get the marketplace going through that period. Little did I know that a few years later, 
of course, 1990, really the export boom really happened. And it was even bigger, much, much bigger boom because we've got the whole world to sell to. Yeah. And so I, I actually then realised it was a really good timing to actually have been born and to be involved in the company and, mm. uh, and to see it go forth. Yeah. So how do you go about that communication, building your brand on a na an international scale? First of all, it's people you know. You know, you put your feelers out there and through friends and friends and friends, you know. Um, and actually, the America, uh, which became our biggest market, like quite a bit bigger than Australia back a while ago. Uh, and um, um, that guy, I actually met having uh, dinner in a tapas bar in Adelaide in Rundle Street. Um, and uh, he was having uh, dinner with a, another mate of mine. And they were leaving. I was just arriving with like 15 blokes. It was a you know, Friday night. We were all going out to you know, carry on. And, uh, and I said, oh, do you want to hang around with us if he's going to bed? And, they, and he said, oh, yeah, sure. And I, I lost him in a nightclub, you know, heaven, I think at three o'clock in the morning. But I'd arranged for him to come down and have a look at our wines. And he'd married an American lawyer and was moved to America and, and was looking for you know, some wine. He had a cheap label, but he wanted a more expensive one. So, so it was a good match. And in the 90s, um, uh, Rosemount and Penfolds did a really good job of setting up a base there. Um, and then we slid in underneath them because our story was more personal and the wines are more one area, so it's like they were ready for that. And I just kept going to all the trade shows all the time and, and we started getting in all the press, of course, because America, the, the sort of press is spectator and whatever is very international and parker of course became very international I met him robert parker who's the god of wine you know was in those days uh, and uh, and he uh, he was uh, always glowing and it was always interesting fun and buzz to be there uh, you know the first years it was slow it's hard work australia wasn't very known or anything and uh, and you keep going back to the best bottle shop in town who was able to listen to you and you'd, you'd go back there and you'd see your wine that you sold them two years ago down under the shelf and you'd, you'd pull it out and go, yeah, look, uh, have a look at this wine. And they'd go, wow, that's really good. And I said, yeah, it's, you've got it down there and that's the price. Well, they went, really? Oh my God, I've got to get behind this. And you just do that you know, over and over in places and they all get behind it and then it's just this this accelerating thing. And then in the end, I uh, was doing, you know, at the beginning I was doing dinners for public. Toward the end, it was really only trade dinners and trade lunches all the time, and mostly, you know, they're the things. So on the weekends, you do some public things because the trade didn't want to know you. But that, you know, if you concentrate on a trade, then, you know, for every trade person, you get lots more um, um, mm. bang for your bucks than, you know, one customer who's going to buy you know, a few bottles or whatever. Yeah. And so you mentioned that, you know, it worked with you sliding in underneath um, Rosemont, etc., because you had a more personal story. And then you've also got the stories around the names of, you know, of your wines. Yeah, we were, we were king of that. So really names didn't really happen until we sort of started them. Uh, in the 80s, we started off with uh, Ironstone pressings uh, and the Noble Riesling in, the, in 80, uh, 85. So we we're the first people to call the wine Noble, uh, the Petraeus wine after the Noble Rot. And now it's a whole category in the, in, uh, the world as Petraeus wines, and, uh, uh, which is great. Uh, I, I didn't want to reserve it just for us. I thought it was too, too good a name for things that you can't call by a, a district, you know, no, after the Noble Rot. Now I sell off uh, single components of that, which are single vineyards, to give even more rich story about exactly what they, what they add to the character of the wine. And those names are things like the Pickwickian, Brogdignian, mm. um, Pickwickian being Mr. Pickwick, you know, the very dapper suit in England, yeah. you know, stripes, very, very stylish. Uh, and uh, Brogdignian means giant, so it's a really big wine, so gigantic is Pick, uh, Brogdignian. Or, or it could be, there's a, another one uh, called the Apotropic Triscadiophobia. <laughs> and so uh, Triscadiophobia is the fear of number 13 yeah. and um, we, it's 13 acres there and, uh, uh, but Apotropic is the warding off of evil and so if you drink this wine then you'll ward off the evil fact that it came from 13 acres is what, yeah. what, what my concept is there. Yeah. But the best name I think is the Senosilicophobic Cat. And senosilicophobia <laughs> is the fear of an empty glass, which we're probably having right now because yeah. we are not drinking. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the best uh, name, I think. Uh, yeah, I had a cat called Booze. 
whose real name was non-alcoholic booze. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we called him Booze for short. So he had sent us a liquor phobia of his life, uh, yeah. thinking he could drink, but it wasn't allowed to drink. So yeah. he suffered from that. And, and funnily enough, I've got another cat wine called the Arthur Zagoraphobic Cat, mm. which is also Sagrantino Cinso. Both of them are Sagrantino Cinso. The, the more expensive one, the Arthur Zagoraphobic Cat, yeah. is um, pressings of Sagrantino. And Arthur Zagoraphobia is a fear of being forgotten. Yeah. And I had a cat called Audrey Hepburn who is just an ordinary tabby. So instead of calling her Audrey, I called her ordinary. And so she had a complex of being forgotten all the time. So every time we talk, <laughs> walk the dog, she'd walk with us for miles, you know. And, and, and so, uh, yeah, the uh, Arthur's agoraphobic cat is pressings of Sagrantino, the most tannic variety of Italy, and it's the pressings of it. So it's a wine that won't be forgotten. And so it's just very fitting. And, and, uh, and I've got an exhibit here with the extinct Sumatran tiger's head from 1878, which you know, won't be forgotten because it's biting bottles of the Arthur Zagoraphobic cat there in uh, on a big scale with a skeleton on the other end so it's sort of quirky it still still won't be forgotten yeah so obviously for you that the the multiple layers of you know thinking and explanation and story and, and weaving all those narratives together where does that come from and, and why do you think that's important for how people interact with your products Probably comes from the fact that I don't sleep much. <laughs> so I'm awake all the time. Um, but uh, and and I think my mother was very eccentric, so maybe I got a bit of that as well. But you're, you're here for a very short time. You're a long time, six feet under. And so, um, uh, if you can, if you can just make it more enriched and more complex and more fun, then uh, the mm. better. I don't, I don't. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, how do, how do you juggle all these balls all the time and doing so many things and whatever?" So well, it's just. It's more fun. It's more rich. Life is more, more enriched. So why wouldn't I? If you got, if you, if you got the choice, you would. You know, I think realistically, you'd need to come here and experience the cube and the different layers a number of times before you're going to be able to absorb and and take that in. You know, how how what's the journey that you want someone to come, and how are you going to connect with them when they come? Um, yeah, I mean, someone could get it all all in one go there's no doubt about it because there's an app you can download and then you can listen to me telling you why each of these items are what they are and so you'll get it all and that's only like 40 minutes you know, of listening to me non-stop um, and and then you know you might want to sit there and look at it so you, you'll be here for a few hours i mean there, there are people i see that come at 10 o'clock in the morning when I was like, you know, going as people are arriving and then at five o'clock I've come in for whatever reason and they're actually just leaving. So they've actually been here seven hours. Yeah. But you know, lunch will take up a fair bit of that as well. There are people who don't even need to be told it and they go, I get it, I get yeah. it, you know, all the time. It's like when I took my clothes off on stage and that was, again, <laughs> another marketing uh, way to be remembered you know, in answer to what are your questions, how do you, how do you market a brand? Oh, Years ago, America Chamber, I am Cham, you know, America Chamber of Commerce and Industry had a, a lunch. It was a debate um, between Barossa and McLaren about who makes the best Shiraz. I ended up miming actually being at Maslin's Beach, which is nudist beach. So I took all my clothes off down to my jocks and, and I handed Lee McCluskey my um, uh, notes and it said that Chester's been dressed by Derenberg and the, the front groin is covered by the laughing magpie and the dead arm and accompanied by the dry dam and hermit crabs. <laughs> and the rear end is covered by the last ditch, which are all labels of mine. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, and then I just mine for 10 or 20 minutes, be at Maslow's Beach with footballs and frisbees and getting in a fight with a dog and whatever. And then I stood up at the edge of the stage and said, there's no Maslow's Beach in Barossa Valley, oi! <laughs> and then uh, you know, they gave me the microphone and then I said, well, you know, the reason that our wines are better than Barossa is because we're near the sea. So we've got the, the influence of the sea, the cooler nights and the wines are better, better fragrant length and more style, elegance and whatever. And, and so that, that, was, that was my whole thing. And, but afterwards people said, oh, we got it before you even got the microphone. You didn't need to do that. So there are people out there who are following the story. <laughs> yeah. And so, so then I suppose the message there is, you know, make sure you be remembered. That's exactly right. If you've got a chance to be on stage, then it's got to be an impact. And I mean, I don't mind. I think you know, winemakers are allowed to be a bit flamboyant, a bit 
weird and whatever because it just adds to the personality mm -hmm. too. You know. and it's not like I'm you know, selling um, uh, I'm bank banker wanting your business. You know, I think that might be a little bit hard to to uh, fathom if they take your clothes off <laughs> talking to the bank manager. Eight minutes is all I had uh, to say uh, in marketing wine. What do you have to do? You have to stand out. Mm. That's it. You have to be memorable in whatever whatever the package is, and uh, but it has to look stylish. Well, of course, maybe I didn't look stylish. Take my clothes off. But Jancis Robinson, who's you know the English wine god, I suppose, of the world, um, uh, you know, took a YouTube of it and put it out there, and a million people saw it you know, straight away. So so sort of, they went Darenberg, and that was you know, it's worth gold. Okay, a final couple of final questions before we finish up. One is the sensory experience. You've really really engaged all senses, you know, you're, that's the aim with, with this project. Why do you think that's important? The whole idea of going to a tasting room is to taste and smell wine, of course, and to, uh, and to have a great fun time. Uh, then I thought, well, that's, let's just build on that and let's amplify it. So the fun time is, you know, part of all the, the museum as you walk into the building. But then also the room of um, 44 different wine aromas in flagons. So you blow the horn, uh, they're on handlebars and they've got a bike horn there, but when you blow it, it just blows air in and out of the, what, the contents of the flagon. The flagon has cherries or an apple or, or um, lychees, capsicum, whatever. What I'm doing is lifting your aroma the senses and a thought of flowers and fruit you know it's going to be all in your subconscious the whole room is covered in flowers and fruit you can't not be feeling flowers and fruit and visualizing that even if you're not thinking it outright it's yeah. down deep in there and then when you get to the tasting room and you're tasting wine you're going to be seeing them uh, without even thinking about it and you're going to think the wine's a lot better than it really is <laughs> <laughs> so it's a marketing ploy it is absolutely <laughs> a sales ploy <laughs> well yeah it's, it's just waking them up that's all <laughs> which is what we're trying to do all the time with wine yeah yeah f fantastic well thank you so much uh, for joining me and sharing us a bit more about the cube in conclusion though, can you share with me Chester's Be The Drop tip? Uh, one, one thing I suppose is webinars. I mean, it's not really a hot tip, people know about them, but we're doing quite a lot of them now internationally, so I don't have to fly to Russia. I don't yeah. have to fly to places a lot. I, we get a whole heap of people in the room and we do a webinar. They all have the wines, I have the wines. I don't even have to drink them because I know them anyway. But, but you know, uh, and we're ta doing a tasting through the webinar, through, Fantastic. and, and uh, um, they, uh, they love it and they ask questions. What I've got to get up really early hours in the morning often or yeah. it's late at night when you feel like, you know, just relaxing or whatever. Yeah. But, but, uh, but it's just a great way to, to connect and do business really. You, know, you don't have to get on a plane all the time. Yeah, so it's a, a way of scaling that process. When you were talking about, you know, in the 90s going over and establishing um, the brand in America, so now you're just scaling that on an yeah. international base, but, yeah. but yeah. virtually. Yeah, I've even done it from the bedroom, you know, just lying in bed, I've done it with us. They thought a bit quirky and weird, <laughs> but uh, you know, there wasn't any hanky-panky, so it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did say you wanted to stand out. And, and then you... Not as a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to share. <laughs> Cheers. Um, then you also mentioned social media. Perhaps we could just quickly talk about that as well. Um, you know, how are you using that? What channels are you using? Facebook and Twitter. Twitter is not growing anymore for us. Uh, Instagram's growing quite rapidly for us now. And, uh, and Facebook, obviously, is a huge one too. Um, uh, and we're doing... We're doing tastings through Facebook and, and I suppose all of them connected actually, live tastings where um, people can go and buy the wine and, and have it in their room and they often have parties uh, and they'll all be sitting there and they'll listen to me talk for 10 minutes to half an hour. I mean, don't want to talk for too long, whatever, yeah. and, and get a bit silly and crazy about that particular wine is what I do. And, uh, and, uh, and they're all, they all get into it and, uh, and then it's on, on YouTube or whatever, or on Facebook. You know. I'm not the best with social media, but someone I've else got does these that people for you. do it for me. They're filming me and doing it. All. But they, they, apparently, um, after we've done uh, one of those tastings, uh, when they go back and have a look at how many times people have viewed those tastings, it's like 30,000 already yeah. after just a few days, 30,000 views of that video. Yeah. So that's a great way of, uh, of getting onto people. And then, then we also engage all those people and do dinners 
in each capital city and invite them to big parties. And so, you know, they're getting so big now, they're sort of like, you know, we have 300 people to a stand-up party instead of a sit-down dinner. And, uh, and so, uh, just keep the ball rolling, keep the story going. And we try, when we, when we engage um, on social media, we try to make it humorous and, and, uh, and soulful. And we try not to overload people too much and not put just average things that I happen to be in you know, this country. It has to be, I'm in this country, but look at this, I'm doing something really crazy, it's really fun and weird or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Chester. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're welcome, Amelia. Cheers. Mm -hmm.